things. Um, so this is a young lady I saw in the, the late aughts. Um, she was a 31 year old, otherwise healthy African-American woman. That is an important detail, so I put it in there. And she came in saying, I wanna be tested for Huntington disease. And I said, okay, why do you wanna be tested for Huntington disease? And so we went through her history. Um, oops. Uh, she had about six months of, um, or she complained of just six months of just some subtle motor dysfunction, a little trouble with writing and typing, picking up small objects. Uh, she felt like her gait wasn't exactly right. This wasn't interfering in any way with her life. She was driving and working at her desk job. Um, and she didn't have really much of anything else going on, uh, memory or cognitive disturbance, her speech or vulvar symptoms or anything at all. Uh, she was otherwise healthy on no medications, no prior illnesses, no head injuries, substance use, anything like that. The striking part of her history was that her father and her father's two brothers and her father's father had all, she told me, died of Huntington disease. And her father went into nursing home care when she was seven. Uh, so I examined her. I didn't find really anything that was impressive. Um, in retrospect, I probably missed a couple of subtle things. Uh, but she didn't have any evident chorea. She didn't have any evident uh, uh, dystonia or rigidity or really much of anything. Uh, it was enough that I was a little reluctant to actually do the test, but she was insistent. Um, and so uh, we talked about it. We did all the genetic counseling. I documented like crazy. Um, and so I said, okay, we'll, we'll send the test, which was commercially available at the time. And the test was negative. And I gave her a call and I said, you don't have Huntington disease. Congratulations via con Dios. Uh, thinking I would never see her again, but if I'd never seen her again, this would not be a very interesting talk. Uh, so she comes back several months later and she says, are you sure I don't have Huntington disease? And I said, yes, I'm sure you don't have Huntington disease, but tell me what's going on. Well, she felt that her motor symptoms were progressing a little bit. She was, uh, had had a couple of near falls at this point, was having more trouble uh, typing at work. And she brought her mother and her mother was noticing some personality changes, she's more irritable, a little more forgetful. Uh, so I re-examined her and, and now I was picking up some things. She has some reduced facial expression, some forehead dystonia, little subtle right-sided rigidity and a gait that and she kind of walked with stiff legs and her lumbar spine extended a little bit, kind of throwing her pelvis out a little bit. I thought, oh, this, this is not normal. There's something going on here. So I got some labs, nothing really came of that. There was a time when I had a, uh, some images of MRI of the brain. I no longer have them, I apologize, but uh, it did show a couple of abnormalities, some striking atrophy, well, not striking, but certainly present atrophy for age and a diffuse pattern and some calcification of the striatum. So convinced that she's got something and uh, I said, well, let's talk a little bit more about your family. Well, where are they from? They said, oh, they're, they're from uh, Alamance County. And I said, oh, really, around Hall River? And she said, yeah. Some of them are from around Hall River. And I said, aha, I know what she's got. She's got the Hall River syndrome. Uh, if you're not as old as I am or not from around here, uh, you might not, that might not ring uh, a bell, but it's uh, uh, a product of this area. And, and it was uh, widely described and discovered here at Duke and UNC. The story starts with a condition called dentata rubra pallid illusion atrophy or DERPLA. Uh, which was probably first described uh, by Smith et al. in the late 50s in a Yugoslavian World War I vet who they described as having ataxia and constant motor restlessness of the body. And uh, at, at autopsy, he had uh, extensive uh, deterioration of the dentata rublo and the palatalusian uh, systems. Um, and a few more cases just, uh, kind of popped up. And then in the early 80s, uh, uh, Naito and Oyanagi described five Japanese families uh, who had various combinations of myoclonic epilepsy, dementia, ataxia, and choreoretitosis. Usually the early onset people had myoclonus and epilepsy and the older onset people had some dementia, progressive dementia with ataxia and or choreoretitosis. And they had uh, the same sort of pattern of um, degeneration of the dentata rubula and palatalusian systems at autopsy. Um, and this was eventually mapped uh, in the early 90s to the 12P chromosome and identified as a trinucleotide repeat disease. Uh, and most of the cases were from Japan. They were, it was thought to be kind of rare elsewhere. And then in 1989, um, a group of scientists at uh, Duke and UNC described five generations of an African-American family originating in Alamance County. 
uh, with an autosomal dominant neurologic disorder with onset of age 15 to 30, existing of ataxia, seizures, uh, choreiform movements, progressive dementia, uh, and progressing to death, um, with uh, neuronal loss in the dentate nucleus and microconstitution of the bonus pallidus, and features that seem to overlap pretty considerably with uh, what was being described as DERPL at the time. And they called this the Hall River syndrome. And in 1994, Jim Burke published a paper uh, which demonstrated uh, from work out of his lab that despite the uh, different cultural origins and the clinical and some, some of the clinical pathological differences, turns out Hall River syndrome and DERPLA were both due to trinucleotide repeat expansions of that same gene. Um, so the DERPLA test was commercially available and I said, okay, let's send that. And I uh, sent it off and it was negative. So now I'm thinking, okay, I've taken my best shot. I need some help. Uh, so I sent it for an academic referral. Um, the first academic referral went to a renowned uh, academic institution about 50 miles to the east of my practice in Greensboro. I don't want to say very much about it apart from it was just not very helpful. Um, so I thought, well, let me try again. So I sent her for a second academic referral. Um, I don't know if it was brilliance on the part of the scheduler at uh, Hopkins or just luck, uh, but she uh, saw uh, uh, this physician, his name is Russell Margolis, he's up at Hopkins. Uh, I was in 10 years, 10 years in private practice in Greensboro, and the number of times I got a phone call from a academic institution about a patient, I can count on one hand. Um, but this was one of them, and this is literally what he said to me. He said, I think I know what she's got. Let me tell you a story. Uh, he sat down with her, he got her history, and he started talking about her family, and he said it was ringing very familiar to him, but he didn't recognize her name. And so as she was going along, he, he, it, it occurred her, to him to stop and say, is your current name your birth name? And she said, no, I took my mother's name uh, when my father went into the nursing home. And she said, okay, well, what was your father's name, if you don't mind my asking? And she said it. And he grabbed his laptop and pushed a few buttons and said, well, was your grandfather so-and-so? And were your uncle so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so? and she said, yes, how did you know that? And he pushed a few more buttons and pulled up a PDF and turned it around and said, does this look familiar to you? And she said, what is my father's family tree doing on your laptop? Well, what it was doing there was that a few years earlier, Dr. Margolis had described a large pedigree of an African-American family with an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by involuntary movements, rigidity, and progressive dementia. Um, and uh, it turns out that she was a member of this index family and had no idea. Uh, he had further gone on to uh, describe the, uh, the genetic abnormality, which turns out is also a trinucleotide repeat. Um, uh, the affected cases had 50 to 60 repeats in an alternately spliced exon of the JPH3 gene on 16Q. Um, and so, uh, and, and by <clears throat> the nomenclature convention at the time, this uh, condition received the name of HDL2 or Huntington disease-like illness 2. Um, <clears throat> all known cases are, are occurring people known or uh, even when they turn up in strange places like Brazil, a strong suspected African ancestry. And some of them even have acanthocytosis, which sometimes confuses it for uh, neuroacanthocytosis, but it is a different disease. Um, so th this genetic test was not commercially available. He was kind enough to do it in his lab. And sure enough, that was what she had. And so the diagnosis was made at that time. Um, so a few lessons from this. Um, you know, the biggest medical fact she, that she gave me in her history was, turns out to be not exactly right. So when patients talk about medical facts, Reagan with the Russians, trust but verify. Uh, when they talk about their experience, they're the only ones that can talk about their experience. So channel your inner phrase, your crane, I'm listening. Uh, everyone's allowed to swing and a miss now and then, uh, like the first academic institution. And again, the point that I always want to emphasize, it's near and dear to my heart. You don't have to be in an academic center to find really cool neurology. This lady literally walked into my uh, private practice in Greensboro in between the migraine patients and the diabetic neuropathy patients. So anyway, that's my case. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I'll... Pass it back to uh, to Rich. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Very, very interesting. So to introduce our grand round speaker, I'm going to throw it to Dr. Nada El Husseini.
Today, our speaker is no stranger to many in this group. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Larry Goldstein, who is the Ruth L. Works Professor and Chairman of the Department of Neurology at the University of Kentucky. He is also the co-director of the Kentucky Neuroscience Institute and co-director of the University of Kentucky Neuroscience Research Priority Area. Dr. Goldstein received his MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York in 1981, where he also did his neurology residency. He then joined Duke for a research fellowship in cerebrovascular disease in 1985, and then stayed on faculty in advance to the rank of professor of neurology and director of the Duke Stroke Center until moving to the University of Kentucky in 2015. He has published over 780 peer-reviewed journal articles, reviews, editorials, book chapters, abstracts, and other professional papers. He is a member of the editorial boards of many prominent medical journals, including Stroke and Neurology, and has chaired multiple national guideline writing committees. He served in multiple leadership roles in both the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Neurology, and has recently been elected to the AAN Board of Directors. He has received multiple awards throughout his career, including the prestigious William Feinberg Award for Excellence in Clinical Stroke by the American Heart Association, and the Order of the Longleaf Pine, which is North Carolina's highest civilian honor by the governor in 2015 for his service to the state related to improving stroke care. Dr. Goldstein is also a prolific teacher and mentor. He was the recipient of the Duke Neurology House Staff Teaching Award several times during his time at Duke. In 2019, he received the Mentorship Award from the Women in Medicine and Science Program at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. I had the honor of learning from him as a neurology resident, training with him as a stroke fellow, and working with him when I first joined Duke on faculty. He has continued to be a trusted mentor for me, who is generous with his time and advice and always does it with grace and kindness. I am very happy to have him back here with us today. He will be talking about asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis, interventional approaches versus medical therapy. Uh, uh, yeah, there yeah. we go. I always <laughs> have to remind myself now to, un to unmute. As a department chair, Dr. O'Brien will tell you that mute function is really quite, uh, uh, quite, quite helpful. <laughs> I should uh, use it more get, often. <laughs> let me get this thing up and running here. There we go. Great. Well, it's uh, wonderful to uh, be back, um, at least electronically, and to see in the chat room uh, a whole uh, a whole group of um, a whole group of friends. Um, what uh, what we're going to do during this uh, month of uh, March Madness, which is probably madder this year than it than it has been in history, uh, is uh, talk about something um, in uh, vascular neurology for which you wouldn't think would be all that controversial anymore. Um, we um, you know, we're evidence based. We try to make our best decisions possible based upon the best data we have. For asymptomatic carotid disease, we have a ton of data, but if, if things were clear, I wouldn't be talking to you about it, right? Because the things that I usually like talking about are things where we end up saying, well, I'm not so sure. Uh, but the, the, what I want the not so sure to be based on is really a really good understanding of why it is we're not so sure and what, the, what some of the controversy is. So uh, to uh, fulfill all of the um, all of the uh, CME requirements, there are our objectives. Uh, we'll be uh, comparing endarterectomy to medical therapy. Uh, we'll be uh, comparing endarterectomy and angioplasty or stenting um, in uh, to endarterectomy in patients with asymptomatic disease. We'll talk about some concepts that are particularly important here, and that's the concept of internal compared to external validity. And then uh, a little bit about the gaps in our current knowledge, uh, with some new wrinkles in the field, um, and uh, then we'll wrap up. 
hopefully with time for questions. And for the disclosures, nothing relevant here. So let's uh, start off with a patient just to get grounded. Um, this, is, this would be a typical patient that uh, Dr. El Husseini might uh, be seeing uh, down, in the, uh, down in the clinic. So a 70 year old man with some history of coronary disease, hypertension and diabetes. He's had that, that terrible term dizziness for two to three years, an occasional uh, room spinning with some lightheadedness. Uh, when he turns to the right, he had a prior uh, ear injury and uh, it probably stems from that. Uh, he had no other neurological symptoms, uh, but as sometimes happens, his uh, primary care physician said, okay, dizzy, uh, let's get a uh, carotid study. So he obtained a carotid duplex ultrasound and uh, there was uh, some concern. So he then went on and ordered a, a CT angiogram. Uh, he was on aspirin, um, atorvastatin, amlodipine, fenfibrate, uh, an oral anti-diabetic drug and uh, some methotrexate. He also had a history of rheumatoid arthritis. And his exam um, was pretty, uh, pretty uh, benign, uh, mild peripheral neuropathy, most likely related to uh, diabetes and uh, some bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So here's his uh, uh, the relevant image from his carotid uh, duplex. Um, you can see there's some turbulent flow in his proximal right ICA. There's some moderate heterogeneous plaque in the bulb. Uh, it peaks systolic velocity of uh, 352 and then diastolic velocity of 74, ratio of 3.4. And that in this laboratory was interpreted as showing about a 70% uh, stenosis. Here's the uh, CT angiogram. It's, uh, it's uh, going to go by on a sin images, and it was, it's about an 80% stenosis, at least that's how it was read of the proximal right ICA, and about a 30% stenosis of the, of the left ICA. So here you be, you're down in the bowels of the clinic. You have this 70-year-old uh, uh, patient with a bunch of vascular risk factors um, that are being uh, hopefully being addressed. And um, he had no real relevant symptoms, uh, but he had a uh, ultrasound that then shows that stenosis and uh, then a CTA uh, that shows about an 80% stenosis with no, with, with no symptoms. So one thing I know that um, I'm not sure how many students you have with you or how many are, or how uh, people remember some of this, but um, it's important to ground this in an um, in understanding of how a stenosis in the carotid is measured. So the uh, traditional way is on this um, a, a catheter angiogram would be that the radiologist would uh, look at the study and say, okay, I think the carotid bulb should be about there, about where that red, uh, red line is that I drew in. And the way that they would uh, calculate the percent stenosis is then to um, calculate the uh, area where of residual uh, lumen, divide it by where they thought the bulb should be, and then calculate a percent stenosis, one minus A over B, okay? Pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward. The problem with this was um, two radiologists might look at this and sort of guesstimate where the bulb should be differently. So as part of the NASA trial, the North American Asymptomatic uh, Carotid Endotorectomy trial, um, they decided that that's not gonna work for a large multi-center randomized trial, which by the way, was the first large randomized trial of a major surgical intervention. So the NASA style uh, type of stenosis was you uh, first look at the residual lumen, you then go distal in the internal carotid artery, one to two, seg one to two centimeters beyond the area of post-stenotic dilatation. That becomes the denominator. You then calculate the percent stenosis as one minus A, A over B. 
Okay, so the difference is that the traditional percent stenosis with the carotid bulb, you have a much, a much larger um, uh, diameter usually. So that traditional percent stenosis is generally much greater than the standardized percent stenosis. But in the clinical trials, whenever you're reading about a percent stenosis, it's measured this way. It's not measured based upon a guesstimate of where the, carotid, where the carotid bulb is. And when you're reading reports, usually you have to look for that term. They usually write in NACID type stenosis. If they don't, then you don't know exactly how the radiologist uh, read that. You either have to go and do the calculation yourself or go back and ask them to clarify how they, how they measured the percent stenosis. So we have this patient, right? They're down there. Dr. El Husseini is saying, okay, I know, I know about this. So uh, a, um, an internal carotid artery stenosis is a risk factor for stroke. This is from the AHA primary stroke prevention guidelines that I helped lead several years ago, but the data hasn't changed. It has a relative risk of about uh, two. The population prevalence overall is around two to three percent, which gives it a population attributable risk for stroke of only two to seven percent. So compared to conditions like hypertension, this is a drop of water in the wind from a population health standpoint. Um, if, if you like, you can go and uh, just Google um, me and JAMA. I just wrote another editorial commentary about population screening for carotid stenosis and why we shouldn't do that. It was a commentary on the USPTF um, a recent, uh, recent guidelines. So we've got three, we, we've got options now. So one option for this patient is <clears throat> we're going to maximize his uh, medical therapy, lifestyle changes, and uh, not, uh, not pursue any intervention. If we pursue an intervention, the two major choices now are either uh, to open his neck and do an endotorectomy under direct surgical guidance, or potentially do an angioplasty and stenting. Both of them can make the pipe look better. Okay, either of those procedures can make the pipe look better. The question is, of those three options now, what are you going to recommend to, to that patient and their, their family? So we talked about the patient example. Now let's uh, move on and talk about endotorectomy. And then, as I said, we'll talk about angioplasty and stenting, why this is a problem currently, and then, and then the future. So first, endotorectomy. So this, this is a uh, timeline of when uh, clinical trials were done, the symptomatic trials of endotorectomy uh, for carotid artery stenosis are at the top and the asymptomatic trials, the major ones are on the bottom. So you can see that these trials are, are um, quite old, right? The VA trial uh, was done in the early 80s, published in 1993. ACAS, the uh, North American study run by Jim Toole out of, out of North Carolina, Bowman Gray, uh, was published in 1995 with data collected between 85 and the early 1990s. And the European trial, ACST, that began after, the, after ACAS uh, was uh, finished in the early 2000s and published in uh, 2004. So keep those dates in mind, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to them. So let's talk about these trials and why are we talking about trials that are that old? Because that's it. All of our guidelines uh, for uh, compared to medical therapy for intervening with endotorectomy in patients with asymptomatic disease are based on those three, those three trials. The VA trial was underpowered, um, so we're, we're not going to uh, talk about that in particular. So ACAS, patients had more than 60% uh, diameter, uh, diameter reduction carotid stenosis. They were under age uh, 79. Uh, they had to have a more than five-year life expectancy. 
no symptoms in the randomized artery, but about 30% of the patients had, had prior stroke or TIA, just in a different vascular distribution. The primary endpoint was ipsilateral stroke, perioperative stroke, or death. And the only required medical therapy, the only required medical therapy was aspirin 325 milligrams daily. There was no prescription for um, antihypertensive treatment, lifestyle changes, and statins basically didn't exist at the time. So, but this is the major North American trial. So these are the data that most surgeons will quote uh, when talking about uh, endarterectomy for asymptomatic stenosis. I shouldn't say most, I don't know if it's most, but these are the data that are, that are, that are, that are quoted. So here's the primary endpoint, the rate uh, frequency of uh, stroke with medical therapy was 11% over five years with, after end autorectomy, 5% over five years, a relative risk reduction of about 53%, a confidence interval between 22 and 72%, statistically significant with a number needed to treat of around 17. So you do 17 endarterectomies to prevent one of these over the next over the next five years. So great, let's take it take it take it to the bank. There are a couple of issues. One was that there was a 2.3 percent perioperative risk, 2.3 percent risk of causing a stroke during during or immediately after the procedure, including a 1.2 percent risk of the angiogram itself. Okay. The other issue was that although the other, uh, the other um, potential outcomes were also all reduced with, with uh, endarterectomy, none of them were statistically significant. It's, it's a sort of an unfair thing to say because the study is empowered to detect or measure these, um, these uh, subgroup differences. But one of the, one of the things that was, that was bothering people was that many of the strokes that occurred were not were not um, uh, life changing life changing events? So, for example, any major stroke or death, there was maybe a nineteen percent reduction. You can see that the rates were uh, frequencies were higher, but uh, so a very very wide confidence interval. So even though um, every physician in the country got a, um, a got, and I still have mine uh, tucked away somewhere, a, um, a um, information sheet from uh, NIH that with these very significant, very important results, um, we were still left not knowing several, several important things. So it was, there was an unclear reduction of fatal or disabling stroke. The study was underpowered to assess a benefit in women. There are way too few women in ACAS to really determine whether there was a difference in uh, response be, uh, to the procedure between men and women. And there was also, surprisingly at first, no relationship between the degree of stenosis and benefit. Right? You'd think that as the degree of stenosis went up that the risk of stroke would go up and that you'd reduce that risk in increasing proportions by doing the intervention. Well, that, that also was not true in ACAS. There was no relationship between the degree of stenosis, at least measured by ultrasound, and, um, and, and, and surgical benefit. So I showed you on that timeline that the European study, the MRC um, asymptomatic carotid stenosis trial uh, began after ACAS and it was aimed at addressing some of those questions. These were folks who had no ipsilateral symptoms in six months. So they could have had a stroke or TIA in that distribution, but it had to be more than six months before. It was ultrasound based. Angiography was not performed. They were confident enough in the ultrasound that they felt that they could move on to a surgery uh, without a confirmatory imaging study. The mean follow-up was three and 3.4 years. Um, and medical therapy, although there were more things available, was at the uh, physician's discretion. It wasn't proscribed in the trial. 
Um, it could include antiplatelet therapy, antihypertensives, and lipid lowering therapy, not necessarily statins. By 2000 to 2003, near the end of the study, about 70% of the patients that had been enrolled um, were, on, were on lipid lowering therapy of some, of some kind. So this is the um, uh, primary result. Any, any stroke or perioperative death, 11.8% reduced to 6.4%, about a 46% risk reduction, number needed to treat um, uh, 18, okay? Fatal or disabling stroke, also a significant benefit, a number needed to treat around 40. Fatal stroke, also reduced by about half. You need to do about, about, uh, about, 50, uh, about 50 of those. So those were the uh, primary results. That carried a risk though. The risk was 3.1%. 3.1%, but that's now without the risk of, of, uh, of, angio, of, um, of carotid angiograms. So if you remember in ACAS, right, it was a 2.3% perioperative risk, but that included a 1.2% risk of, of the angiogram. Here, they eliminated the risk of the angiogram. So their surgical complication rate was about twice that of, about twice that of ACAS, okay? So something else to think about. Now, what about the degree of stenosis, right? That was one of the things, one of the questions that the ACST was intended to address. So here's the uh, percent stenosis, 70 to less than 80, 80 to 89, and 90 to 99. Here's the relative risk reduction in the numbers needed to treat. So one thing that was a bit surprising here uh, was that yes, between um, uh, between 70 and uh, and 89 percent stenosis, there's about a 50 percent. They found about a 50 percent risk reduction. Cool, but when they got up to 90 to 99 percent stenosis, this is the thing that you get an alarm. You need to come in and and be intervened on immediately because you're about to lose your carotid artery. There was no benefit at all in that, in that group. The rates of, um, the rates of stroke uh, with a deferred uh, endotorectomy was 5.6%, 5.4% in folks who had, uh, had immediate endotorectomy. So, you know, uh, we struggled a bit with this. Um, there are a couple of potential hand-waving explanations for it. One was that uh, this was based on carotid ultrasound, remember, and the capacity of ultrasound to make these differentiations isn't great. But another probably more physiologic explanation that makes sense is that when a patient gets to a 90 to 99% stenosis and they've had no symptoms at all, it may be that they're compensated, that they have much better collaterals. So you, those patients can lose this carotid completely and never have an event and never have any symptoms. But that again is something needed that you need, need to keep in mind. Just because these percent stenosis is more than 90 doesn't mean this is a medical emergency and we need to do something about it now. If anything, there's little evidence that that group necessarily benefits. The other thing that I just showed you, right, was that the rates for ACAS and ACST, that primary result was about the same, 11% over five years reduced to around 5% over five years. But the endpoints weren't the same. ACAS and the ACST used different endpoints. So what I did here, this was a paper I uh, wrote several years ago in circulation and cardiovascular intervention um, was I went back, got the primary data, and recalculated all of the ACST endpoints using, uh, using the ACAS endpoints. So now you're uh, uh, comparing uh, apples to apples. And in fact, the ACST didn't replicate ACAS. Here's the ACAS data, the data I showed you before, 11% reduced to 5.1%. Using that same endpoint, ACST, there was no benefit, 19% reduced and 19.2%. Uh, but not only that, the rates uh, with endotorectomy in ACST 
were about four times higher than they were than they were in ACAS. And then you can go down and look at all of the other um, uh, su secondary uh, secondary endpoints. The one thing that is of some importance is if you look at any major stroke or death, ACAS versus ACSD, the rates are obviously higher. There was a significant benefit um, in this recalculated data for ACAS, not so much for, for ACSD. The other thing that we were able to do, and I did this with uh, Peter Rothwell from the, uh, from the UK, is now putting both trials together to try to address the question of whether there was a, different, a difference in benefit between men, men and women. So we did, uh, we did this meta-analysis um, asking just that question. So here's ACST and ACAS looking at the benefits. This is any stroke or perioperative death looking by a treatment by sex interaction. Remember, if you're doing a subgroup analysis, what you need to do is test for a primary treatment by subgroup interaction. So that interaction was statistically significant. So what that tells you is that yes, men and women differ in the potential benefit of or effect of endotorectomy. And here's the, here's, you can see again, the overall benefit in men, about a 50% reduction and no benefit in women. Okay. In women, you see it's, uh, the, it's the point estimate is, at, is basically at unity with a, with a confidence interval that extends on both sides. So uh, if that patient that we had uh, that I told you about to start with was a woman as, as opposed to a man, we've got even more, more problems now because we really have no evidence that women benefit from, from, from endotorectomy for asymptomatic stenosis. Again, not based on this clinical, these clinical trial data. So let's uh, switch gears now and let's move on to angioplasty and stenting. So the problem we have here now is that we have a quote, established proven therapy, which is, end, which is endotorectomy. So with that, you can no longer test another intervention against medical therapy alone. So all of the angioplasty and stenting trials are now compared to the standard therapy, the uh, commonly used therapy, which is, which is, which is endotorectomy. Mm -hmm. So here are the uh, endotorectomy versus angioplasty and stenting randomized trials. You can see that they range uh, in time, again, from the 1990s, the last being uh, completed at about uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, with the trial published in, uh, in 2000, 2010. So let me just uh, show you just a couple of them. Uh, one of the ones uh, that uh, was probably the largest, earliest one done was, uh, was Sapphire. And uh, this one was actually run uh, by uh, Dr. Yadav. Dr. Yadav was uh, one of our residents at UK. He did a, at UK, at, uh, at Duke. He did, a, uh, he did a neurology residency, an internal medicine residency, then did a radiology residency, and then did uh, neuro intervention. So he was one of the early uh, neuro interventionalists in the country. So this study was a prospective randomized trial, 334 subjects. They could be either symptomatic or asymptomatic and had a very uh, a number of uh, components of a uh, composite. Uh, a primary endpoint of stroke, death, or MI within 30 days, or death or ipsilateral stroke between 30 days and, and, one, and one year. So here is the primary endpoint of, um, for stenting compared to endotorectomy. Stenting um, uh, in angioplasty had a primary endpoint rate of around 12.2% compared to 20% uh, for endotorectomy a significant uh, difference. The study was designed for non-inferiority and it made the non-inferiority boundary. Uh, you can see here some of the other differences. One of the things that we'll come back to was myocardial infarction, okay? The rate of myocardial infarction was uh, just a little over double 
with endotorectomy compared to and compared to um, angioplasty and stenting. Most of these, if not all of them, were non-Q-wave MIs. So these are uh, either um, non-Q-wave EKG changes or or troponin or, or troponin based. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. So that was the study overall for asymptomatic patients, for asymptomatic patients, which is the topic that we're talking about now, the 30-day rate uh, with stenting was 5.4%, 10% with endotorectomy, not a significant difference, but remember this is an underpowered subgroup, but the uh, reduction was about half at one year, 9.9% compared to 21.5%, and that was significant. So, okay, great. So what's the problem? What's the problem here? This is the problem. What's the rate of stroke with somebody who has an asymptomatic stenosis if you just leave them alone or treat, uh, basically treat them medically? The historic rate based on the randomized trials, remember, is around one to 2% per year. So the rates here are almost an order of magnitude higher than the rates that you would expect just based upon the natural history of the disease. So one would conclude or could conclude from this that you shouldn't have done either of these things to this population of patients, at least the patients uh, that, that had a risk profile similar to the ones that were included, included in this trial. Okay, um, the second one that we're just going to talk a bit about is the is uh, CREST, the carotid revascularization endotorectomy versus stenting trial. So CREST randomized about 2,500 uh, people into stenting versus endotorectomy. You can see that there were about 12, 1,300 analyzable patients in each. They also had a combined primary endpoint per procedural stroke, MI or death, or ipsilateral stroke within four, within four years. The primary endpoint, which was again here, 3.5% versus 3.6% hazard ratio of one, okay? So basically the study was saying, showing that if you look at that combined composite endpoint, there's no difference between doing endotorectomy and, um, and, and carotid artery angioplasty and stenting. This being a lot less invasive, right? I showed you that picture to start with showing somebody's neck opened as opposed to a nice little picture, uh, a big operative procedure versus a, non, a, non, a, non, a, a minimally invasive procedure that would sort of thing make you think that, well, let's do this. The problem is here. The problem is remember that we're doing this procedure to prevent stroke, right? That's why we're doing the procedure. And we talked about what the rate of stroke was. With the folks who had carotid artery stenting had a stroke rate of around, a periprocedural rate of around two and a half percent versus 1.4% with endotorectomy. That's a hazard ratio of 1.88, not statistically significant, but get it, but but pretty close, almost a doubling of the of the rate of stroke with stenting compared to endotorectomy. That was balanced by the reverse with with MI, okay, 1.2 versus 2.2. So when you put it all together, you got this balance. But the thing that we're trying to prevent was actually almost double the risk, the risk with carotid angioplasty and stenting. Okay. Out to four years, pretty much the uh, the same uh, this, this, the 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 same result, not broken down by by type. But we'll we'll come back to this again in a minute. If you go out to ten years, again, pretty much the same thing. So one of the uh, features that was investigated in CREST was whether there was an age by treatment interaction, right? One thing that one might intuitively think is that older patients would be at greater risk for open procedures, greater risk of, um, of um, anesthesia if it was done on anesthe under anesthesia. So maybe the older patients would benefit more from angioplasty and stenting compared to endotorectomy. Well, once again, a great hypothesis slain by data, right? That's why um, in the American Academy of Neurology guidelines, 
there are no um, uh, there are no expert opinions uh, because experts are wrong way more than we're right. So here's the data. You can see that endarterectomy better up here, and stenting better down here. This is age. Here's the point estimate, the 95% confidence intervals. You can see that as age goes up, the benefit of endarterectomy compared to carotid angioplasty and stenting goes down. So that in older patients from these, uh, these data, one would suggest that you shouldn't be thinking about angioplasty and stenting. You should be doing, and if you're going to do anything, you would be doing endarterectomy. Now, remember, this is not just asymptomatic patients. This is the combined. This is the combined cohort. This is the a meta analysis of all of the asymptomatic trials, and again, it doesn't change what I what I just told you. It's all pretty uh, pretty much the same. There's a reduction or a lower risk of MI uh, with uh, angioplasty and stenting, and a lower risk of stroke with um, with, um, with with endarterectomy overall. So what is so? How do you balance those? Right. Overall, it's a wash. So one way to try to balance it is to think about how this affects these two conditions affect people in their real life. So this was a, uh, a, an analysis that, uh, that I did along with Tom Brott of the data from, um, uh, from ACAS, uh, from, uh, from CREST. Here's the different components of the SF36. This is what patients would prefer uh, if they had stroke versus none, MI versus none, or cranial nerve palsy. That is one of the major complications of, uh, of open carotid endarterectomy is cutting one of the lower cranial nerves. But if you look at this preferences for stroke, they all favor and significantly so um, uh, had, uh, against stroke. Okay, so better life without MI none of them make a difference except the impact on general health. And cranial nerve palsies, none of them were significant, okay? So that's where we are with endarterectomy. That's where we are with carotid angioplasty and stenting. So now you've got all of this data, right? We're evidence-based, you've got all of this data and we say, okay, um, I'm not so sure but we've got an additional complication that we need to think about. And that gets to internal versus external validity. So internal validity, right? That's based on the integrity of the study. It's designed, is it randomized? Are there equivalent baseline characteristics? All the things that we do to figure out whether a study is done at high quality. External validity is, the re is that the results should be relevant to a specific group of patients outside of the clinical trial setting. So if I do take the results of this clinical trial and now I do this to my patients in the real world, do I find the same thing? Well, let's look at a graphic. So the way this works is that you, if you're doing a clinical trial, you've got the entire patient population you take out a sample, right? You don't do a trial on the entire world. So you have a sample that should be representative if it's done correctly of the patient population. You then do your randomized trial. You've got a treatment effect. You then draw inferences for that pop back to that population as you apply that data in the real world. The problem is that these randomized trials are snapshots in time and things change, right? And with time, there are secular changes, changes in the patient population, changes in the real world. So now that environment, right, that, draw, patient, that population in the real world is not necessarily the same as it was before. You got, you got less red people, more gray people here, et cetera. So now as you're taking that treatment effect that were based on this population and now you're trying to apply it now, it doesn't always work, so that's a problem. So what, what was, what, let's think back now to that timeline. What was life like when the randomized trials of the endarterectomy compared to, um, uh, compared to medical therapy? What else was going on in the real world? 
Well, that was the Mac that I used to carry over to my lab at Duke every day from home. This was the, um, this was the lap, uh, laptop of the time. So I would haul this thing back and forth in a big, big bag to, to the lab uh, and home every night. Uh, that, was the, um, that was the cell phone at the time of ACAS. And uh, that was the new invention. That was the Walkman, the iPad, uh, the iPod uh, predecessor back in 1993 when, a when the ACST was started. So the question is, are these review trials that are all now class one studies, right? These are all well done, internally valid, randomized controlled trials. Are those results valid now in 2020? Well, this is some of the issues, okay? I told you what the medical therapy was like then, okay? And medical therapy has evolved over time. So what you're looking at here now is the event in the event rates in control groups. These are now secondary prevention trials starting out back here in the 1980s and going to the mid 2000s. And you can see that all of these regression curves are going down, okay? So overall, over that period, there was about a 43% reduction in the control groups in randomized trials of secondary prevention in the, um, uh, for recurrent stroke, about an 86% reduction in fatal stroke, and about a 42% reduction in major vascular events. The same thing is true for um, asymptomatic stenosis. This was published by Ann Abbott. 1980 going to around 2010. These are the rates from now observational studies in control groups of, of groups of patients with asymptomatic stenosis. So depending upon which study you look at, the degree of reduction uh, changes some, but overall you can see a plummeting of the rates. Here's another analysis done the same, way, uh, same sort of way. This is for any stroke um, 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 uh, with a 70 to 99% stenosis, a 60 to 69% stenosis, and a 50 to 99% stenosis. And then in the open box, the open, um, the open symbols, uh, ipsil ipsilateral stroke. And you see overall, no matter how you cut it, a dramatic reduction. And finally, uh, this is a mega regression analysis from uh, cohort studies of patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Again, over time, going a little bit later, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same basic, the same basic deal. So, is this happening in the real world? There is one study that I just want to touch on very briefly, and so that we can have a couple of minutes uh, for uh, to talk together. This was a comparative effectiveness study of endarterectomy compared to medical therapy. This is based on VA data. Uh, this just published in uh, JAMA Neurology just last year. What they did basically was construct two cohorts, it's one that was called a pragmatic sample, which, is, uh, which was aimed at reflecting real world practice, and then an ACST type sample which had strict inclusion exclusion criteria very similar to the clinical trials. Overall, they found a 2.5% risk of perioperative stroke or death. And then the outcomes were either fatal and non-fatal stroke or stroke and death. So these are the results for the pragmatic sample and the more clinical trial strict kind of sample. This was the ACST rate of fatal or non-fatal stroke, 5.6% with endarterectomy, 7.8% with medical therapy, um, a reduction of about 0.46% per year, okay? Which is about a half to a quarter of what was seen in ACAS, okay? Overall, if you include all cause mortality, right? There's no significant benefit in this real world sample. So Dr. Hosseini is sitting down there again in the clinic with that patient now understanding all of this complexity and all of these issues and internal and external validity. What are you gonna recommend? Well, this is what the guidelines, uh, the national guidelines say, this was, these really haven't changed any. This is from the uh, guidelines that I helped write. 
So um, it's uh, prophylactic endotorectomy, uh, stenting might be considered in highly selected patients. There's a lot of equivoc equivocating here because what we need to do is look at the extent randomized controlled trial data, which is class one evidence, but then temper that by the fact that times have changed and we're really worried now about external validity. External validity isn't real, changing external validity really isn't incorporated into guideline, guideline recommendations. The same thing for prophylactic, uh, prophylactic endotorectomy. Plus it has to be done relatively, uh, relatively safely. So that's sort of where, 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 we are, where we are now. But just to complicate things even more, right? We've got things that are hopefully going to provide more data to, to help us in, in, the, in the future. One is CREST2. CREST2 now recognizing that we don't know quite what to do here is um, redoing basically endotorectomy versus me best medical therapy and carotid, autoretic, carotid endotorectomy, uh, uh, sorry, carotid angioplasty and stenting versus best medical therapy, two basically parallel randomized trials. This uh, CREST-2 started enrollment in 2014 is scheduled to be completed in uh, 2022. If the rate of events is similar to what I just showed you, a 0.49% annual difference, um, annual rate with medical therapy, this study is going to be terribly underpowered. If you do the math, you need about 40,000 patients in a randomized trial to be able to detect the same 50% relative difference that was detected in, um, in, um, in the randomized trials. Second thing is that technology doesn't stand still. This is a new procedure, transcarotid artery revascularization called uh, TCAR. And uh, what TCAR does is uh, to um, first cannulate the proximal to the area of stenosis, then run a tube through a filter in pump down to return the circuit to the circulation in the groin. You turn this thing on and then you reverse flow. So the idea here is that you can then non-invasive or using minimal intervention, treat the stenosis in any of the junk that would have gone north into the head instead is directed south into, into, into the, uh, after being filtered, the blood, returning the blood down. So uh, the initial data, this is uh, from a registry, suggests that this might be safer than, uh, than um, transfemoral um, um, carotid artery uh, angioplasty and stenting. Um, the differences for the most part aren't, aren't, aren't significant yet. This is based on, you see 10,000 patients who had a uh, transfemoral carotid artery angioplasty and stenting compared to about 600 having TCAR. But we can do CREST and similar studies that are ongoing. And then the next thing will be, well, yeah, but now we got this. So now CREST is no longer, CREST is no longer relevant. Um, but we'll see. So what I try to do with you is really go through the data and what seems to be a relatively straightforward uh, decision based upon class one evidence from randomized trials. Um, not, so, not, not so clear what to do. Then you add on that the problem of internal versus external validity and you're even, you're even less clear. Then you've got the issues related to the degree of stenosis and knowing that there is no evidence really that that procedure is any benefit of any benefit in women. So um, again, I, you know, I like talking about things that at, at first blush, you think we've got a ton of data to help guide our, our decisions, but even with all of that data, things aren't necessarily so straightforward. So with that, I'm sorry I went over over a minute, um, uh, but uh, lots lots of good things to talk about. Uh, thank you, Larry. So, what do you say to the patient now? We'll take yeah, Nada uh, out of there now. It's right. you. Well, we're 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 doing crest. We're doing crest too. Uh, so, uh, what we recommend is go through this process. And, um, and uh, try to um, tell the patient that we are not sure what to do in this current, in this current time. 
And um, would you consider uh, being in a randomized trial? If the patient says, no, you know, uh, just like I'm not, uh, you know, you ain't experimenting on me, um, then we're in a bit of a, then we're in more of a quandary. And then it becomes uh, patient, uh, patient preferences to some degree, knowing what the data are. Um, I tend, uh, would tend uh, not to, you know, to advise um, uh, women that we have no evidence at all that this is a benefit in women. I mean, that the data are the data. I mean, that, that's what it is. Um, in folks who have very high grades of stenosis, I'd be even, even more, more cautious. Um, there is another analysis, again, a post-hoc analysis of ACAS data in uh, patients who had a complete carotid occlusion on one side and a, an asymptomatic stenosis on the contralateral side. Those patients also did better with medical therapy than with, than with the endarterectomy. So uh, again, the, you know, the data is always, is always difficult when we, struggle, when we struggle with it, when we actually go through, go through and look at, look at it. That, uh, that, that we have time, yeah. So feel free to ask your questions or just put your name in the chat and I, I'll call on you. Nada? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, for a great talk. I have two quick questions. Uh, do you have any hypothesis for why women don't benefit as much? And second, are you using any TCDs um, data, whether emboli monitoring or vascular reserve to help with some of these decisions for asymptomatic carotid stenosis? Yeah, so uh, the reason that women uh, women seem not to benefit, it really is hard to know the, uh, to be able to answer, answer, answer that because again, we don't have any, any data. I can tell you that the um, surgeons say doing the operation uh, can be a bit, for endoterectomy, can be a bit more challenging in women. Uh, the arteries uh, tend to be a bit smaller. Um, uh, Dr. McCann, our, our uh, surgeon at, um, at, uh, at Duke, uh, he used to do the things he uh, had, had, had said that. Um, and also, uh, he had also, um, if you look at the data <clears throat> carefully, which we uh, didn't really go through, uh, there seems to be a higher risk with doing endoterectomies on the left compared to the right, and that's a right-handed surgeon doing something on the left side. So there are a whole, you know, panoply of potential of, um, you know, of potential issues to think about. But do I have an answer for it? No, I, I, I don't know. Anything I would say would be pure, pure hand waving. I can make up a whole bunch of stuff, but it would be, be just that. The uh, second question is, no, we, we really aren't, aren't using a TCD monitoring. I know Dr. Spence up in um, Canada is a major uh, proponent of, of that. Um, the, uh, and there are some data that suggest folks who have a high uh, burden of um, a microemboli might benefit more. Uh, but then again, they also haven't necessarily been treated with high dose statins and, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, um, aggressive medical, th medical therapy either. And there are no prospective randomized trials of any size <laughs> using that criteria as, as, a selection, as a selection criteria. So yeah, you know, again, you could, there's, you could certainly construct a rationale for that. Um, but there are no, there are no uh, definitive data to show that that decision is any better than any other decision. Right, we'll, we'll go to Shruti next and then finish it with Wayne. Be aware of, and I, I, <laughs> oh, sorry. I think I might have hit a button by accident. Oh, no question? No, I think it may have been an accident. I've been switching between screens, trying to find things. <laughs> thanks, Shruti. Uh, Wayne? Yeah. Well, thanks, Shruti. So I got a chance to look early. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Larry. That was a great talk. I think you made a great point, you know, internal and external validity. The issue is, you know, it takes too long for a clinical trial completed, particularly for the NIG funded study. Tend is the funding is less adequate for the trials, is less, you know, it's less biased. The industry trial, they have much more funding, but they tend to a little, little biased. Uh, so how are we gonna just solve the problem? You know, it just <laughs> take enormous long. 
and then it changes and most of try the time they run find a power cap, which was back the power calculation. Yeah. You know, for more than half of trials at this moment is incorrect. So uh, yes, so. and and that and you know again I think we do these you need to we need to do these things with our eyes with our eyes opened and not for and not for for ourselves about what the data is actually indicating. Uh, the other argument we had in even the angioplasty and stenting trials, well that technology is old and now we're doing it this way and this way based on this case series is clearly much is clearly much better right we did that the original angioplasty and stenting trials didn't have distal <laughs> embolic protection well now we got distal embolic protection and things are much better well maybe not and now we move on to the next thing we'll get crest done after two decades crest two after a decade and a half two decades of a study and the answer will be that well now we've got TCAR so all of that's obsolete and it doesn't doesn't and it's and it's not relevant anymore. So we're always going to be struggling struggling with this. These randomized trials are designed as best we can at the time, but mm -hmm. struggle with external validity is going to be with us forever. So that study that I showed you at the uh, that was done in the VA system is really one way of trying to address that very high quality, very sophisticated analysis, large, um, large data, large data set, big data, analyzed in a very rigorous way, saying that in the real world, um, this doesn't seem to be of any benefit and maybe we should be refocusing. Those types of studies with on, you know, now that we're moving everything to EHRs and massive databases, uh, we may be able to figure these things out at least as best we can a lot quicker than we could before. And the other point is that uh, remember the, uh, the highest level recommendations in evidence-based guidelines is based on prospective randomized trials. And that makes total sense. But what we need to do again is stand back and say, is that stand randomized trial, how does that apply to my patients today? And clearly, the studies that we did like ACAS, where the only medical therapy was 325 of aspirin per day, compared to what we're doing today in medical, with, with medical therapy, it, it, you can't, they're completely non-comparable. Non, non you cannot do that comparison, which again is the, is, is the point here. I agree with you. I think we should look for answer other than clinical trials. This is also a similar issue for the indoor, you know, uh, endovascular therapy at this moment, you know. Um, yeah. So with the large data sets, artificial intelligence, we should have looking for answer rather than clinical trials. Right. Just and, take too long. And, and that's why the, you know, that's why we now in neurology have um, sub-specialty training in each one of, in, you know, in, dozen, in a dozen different areas. These data are complicated um, and uh, being able to apply them uh, in clinical care is becoming increasingly complicated. Believe me, I saw Dr. Skeen was on, you wouldn't want me playing around with some of these MS, uh, MS drugs now, right? Um, I, I would be a loose cannon, you know, I'm saying, you know, the, these drugs can be incredibly efficacious but also in the wrong hands, uh, be incredibly dangerous. Same thing with all the things that we're doing now in stroke. This was just on one aspect of prevention. The body of literature now is just tremendous and uh, sorting through all of this and applying it to individual patients, increasingly complicated. Um, yeah, Larry, but, but some of us in like the dementia field would love to tackle issues of this versus that as opposed to nothing you know right. yeah. oh yeah yeah and uh and uh then once we got it like look look at the um you know, again going to ms uh you know the uh, new therapies uh for neuromyelitis optica right the and the um, monoclonal antibodies directed at you know the aquaporin for positive neuromyelitis optica patients um, we've now got drugs that are that are FDA approved uh, to do that. 
Um, they haven't been compared to each other, and they haven't been compared um, to rituximab, right, which is a much cheaper drug that had been used uh, for that condition based on case series. Um, so uh, you're right, um, finding something that, that does any of any benefit is great, but those new drugs that are specifically FDA approved very, you can't, you can't use them. The, uh, the insurance companies won't approve them. They cost, you know, $700,000 a year uh, for, uh, for, for, one of, for one of those drugs. So even, even uh, Dr. O'Brien, if you had a new monoclonal antibody directed at whatever, whatever it is you want to direct it at, you know, uh, amyloid, beta, whatever, um, and it was going to be $800,000 a year, you still wouldn't have a, a, a proven treatment that you'd be able to use in your patient. So it, we, the, the, these things are, again, complicated. If, if we're easy, right, we put, we put our patients into, a, into our EHR, put in their data and it tell us what to do. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think we're going to be employed for quite some time. Speak for yourself, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> all right larry thank you so much and have a safe day everybody okay and and to all my friends at duke um uh, march madness is, um, is upon us and it's going to be uh, mad, more maddening than usual <laughs> thank you. okay take care all bye thank you